Tim, congratulations on being elected leader of the Liberal Democrats. Um, how do you feel? Were you expecting it? Was it closer than you thought? Well, I wonder your question. I mean, I, I, I guess, first of all, I'm massively optimistic about what we have ahead of us. Uh, I'm, I am genuinely honoured, I suppose, just for a moment, if you think, you know, you, you join a party when you're 16 as a foot soldier, you don't really expect to lead it one day, but you shouldn't spend more than five minutes feeling honoured, um, and I've had that five minutes, so right. let's get on with, um, with the job. And the job is trying job to make to sure we resurrect the Liberal Democrats' fortunes, and there's plenty of opportunity for us to be hugely optimistic about it at the moment. Okay, so you've said, as part of your campaign, you said there was going to be a fresh start. What, what does a fresh start look like? Well, in one sense, we've got no choice but to make a fresh start. Uh, we find ourselves with eight MPs. Yesterday I spoke mm -hmm. in the welfare bill and led the Liberal Democrats into the no yes. lobby against the government's uh, uh, cuts on welfare. And indeed, with three Labour leadership contenders sitting on their hands and refusing to follow us, it reminds you that there is real space there for a principled opposition to the Conservatives that is economically credible, that doesn't in any way throw, throw away the economic credibility that Nick Clegg, Daniel Alexander, David Laws and others uh, hard won for us in, uh, in government, but nevertheless demonstrates that compassion and says, look, if we want Britain to be better, then what you need to do is make sure that we eliminate inequality, not widen it. Okay, so you've... Um this, this is a fresh start, so what were you doing when you're in your first 100 days? What's that actually going to look like in practice? Okay, I mean, first of all, I think there's, there's my, my three kind of major priorities are about visibility, uh, dynamism, and I would say viability. Uh, they're VDV. Uh, visibility is just being everywhere as much as humanly possible through the media, but physically getting around the country and making sure that I mm. uh, demonstrate by my actions that next year's elections in Scotland and Wales, here in London and across the rest of England, are of absolute importance. They are just as important as 2020, and when all said and done, if they, uh, if they are also staging point to 2020 as well. So visibility, being everywhere, getting a clear message across. But with eight MPs now and a you know, reduced number of MEPs and other representatives, how are you going to get that visibility if the media aren't asking? I guess it's, you've more? got to pick issues uh, where you can get through. And so, for example, on the current situation with ISIS in Syria, mm. uh, we see a situation developing where um, not only has Parliament been, uh, I would say, undermined by the uh, evidence that a British military personnel have been involved in Syria against the express wishes of Parliament. But also, probably more worrying even than that, is David Cameron saying that he will help the US to defeat ISIS, which is to totally misunderstand what's going on there. Over 95% of those murdered by ISIS are Muslim. And the reality is the battle is between ISIS and the other Muslim communities. And we need to stand alongside our Muslim communities in Britain and indeed around the countries with the countries in and around the ISIS controlled territories and say we should be supporting you to defeat ISIS, not allowing this to be some kind of West versus Islam uh, narrative, which is exactly what ISIS wants. And we must fight against David Cameron's, shall we say, Blair complex on this issue. Right. So, you said that um, you'd like to see a party with 100,000 members now, and we're on uh, 60 and something thousand, I think. So, how are we actually physically going to recruit those people then? Well, I think some of the most uh, keen recruiters we've got are the 17,000 plus uh, new members. Right. Uh, but it, we've also got to pick the issues upon which we campaign. And don't just try and win airtime, but try and win mm -hmm. hearts and minds and people's uh, credit card details in right. the process. Well, it's going to take uh, doorstepping and it's going to take it, our members on the street. It is. I think that um, the danger is that we end up in this era we're in now. We think that the only thing that works is social media. It really isn't. It isn't it's a really important part of our toolkit. Uh, but actually physically being on doorsteps and being present and seen is absolutely everything. Um, but nevertheless, running campaigns through social media and other means on having a right and liberal intelligent approach to uh, to ISIS, about having the right approach to housing association sell-offs. These are ways in which you galvanise a community, a physical one or a more dispersed one, into thinking not only do they agree with us on this issue, but I want to come and join you as a consequence. It was housing that got me into the Liberal Democrat to the Liberal Party in the first place as a teenager. So I realised my passion uh, to try and tackle homelessness and poor housing first before I realised as a party that shared my views on it second. That's generally how it is with people. If you are the kind of person who thinks, 
it is just illiberal, un-British and wrong to have your emails snooped upon, then you will perhaps join a campaign opposing that first before you then realise, and here are the people who share my feelings on these things. So how we go and get those extra mm. tens of thousands of members is about focusing on those issues and making sure we give people the opportunity that every interface they have with us to come and join us more, more generally, not just on that particular subject. Okay, so within the Liberal Democrats there's always been a, a, a good healthy amount of discussion and disagreement, but when we're coming up to elections and new rounds of campaigning, um, it's important to get everyone willing to join in and help mm. the effort. So what would you say to those people who voted for Norman Lamb in the leadership election? Um, what, how are you going to bring everybody on board now? Yeah, well, I mean, I, first of all, I mean, Norman did an outstanding job, mm -hmm. um, and I think the leadership campaign was good for everybody. It was very inclusive, uh, it was a good nature debate, and I think it, it gave the opportunity to talk about a whole range of different issues mm -hmm. that, um, that unite us, and that was I think, the most obvious thing as you went through those hustings, those who went to Austin, I think there were 27 mm -hmm. of them or something, um, was the absolute you know, level of unity, really, between the, the two of us. Uh, I mean, what I would say to anybody who voted for Norman is that you know, join, join the club, I have voted for the loser in internal elections more often than I voted for the winner. Um, and, and I don't think I've ever felt particularly bruised um, by, the, by the outcome, because in the end this is an internal election and we've got to work together and you always know that right the way through. I think the important thing is that you know, Norman himself, but people who are key supporters, you know, like Lynn Featherstone and others, others um, uh, will be absolutely key to uh, at the centre of, of my team as we move forward. Uh, there, is, there are no you know, um, uh, Fahrenheit's or Norm Troopers anymore, we're all Liberal Democrats. Okay, so uh, not Norman and, himself then, and, uh, have a bit well Yeah, I, I absolutely want him to do that. Right. I mean, it's worth saying that, and I did mention this on one or two hustings as well, when I was first elected in 2005, mm. Andrew Stunnel, who was then the Chief Whip, appointed Norman as my mentor. Um, and one of the key things he taught me is how to make best use of your resources, best use of your time, mm. to make the most difference for your constituents. And it's one of the reasons why I kind of followed him in having a big uplifting majority. Uh, I always say that I, I, was, I, was, um, I was elected or re-elected with a big majority because I did the things that Hillary Stevenson told me to and did the things that uh, Norman Lamb did. Do you put um, him at his own game? And, um, uh, well, not at all. I mean, we, but I think, so first of all, I mean, unity is absolutely everything. I think we have yeah. got to absolutely now as a party claim that space, which is uniquely ours. We are a liberal party. We believe in tolerance. We believe in diversity. We believe in a party that takes the lead on being ambitious for the country. You know, I, I'm, I do take, both of us talked about Beveridge a lot in the election. Right. And the thing I always take from Beveridge more than anything else, actually, was his ambition for his ideals. This is a man who was a member of Parliament for one single year, William Beveridge, uh, and yet he wrote the blueprint for a better Britain. He looked beyond what was possible and towards what was necessary. And I think along with Norman, and indeed the rest of our parliamentary team, but more importantly the 60 odd thousand members and rising that we have at the moment, we've got to decide, uh, we've, got, we've got the audacity and uh, the impertinence to stand up to these lot on the other side of the road and say, you know, Britain needs a strong liberal voice uh, that stands up for human rights, stands up against internet surveillance, that stands up for those people desperate for an affordable home, stands up for green issues, and also stands up for our Free Information Act and against outrageous, counterproductive, illiberal incursions into, into Syria. So, inspiring people, we've got conference in Bournemouth in a few weeks' time. Oh, yeah. Have you started writing your speech yet? I have not. I have not. I mean, I've been saying that. Uh, I suppose I'm going to get cracking. And I, whenever I make speeches of that kind, and I guess I've never made a speech of that kind. This before, would be the leader's speech right. that everyone so, comes to. Um, it's true. Um, having said that, um, I am not a person to judge um, you know, the quality of speeches I may have made or may or not may or may not have made in the past. You've made a few um, rally ones and all but, of that. So. But this is a different kettle yeah. of fish. I often think the ones that you spend the one. So I think we have to do some work on it early. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think the best line does come in the last day or two. Um, okay, <laughs> sounds like an essay crisis in the making. It's slightly. I mean, I was always very, I was always quite good at um, doing essays and things on time. But I just so for example, you know, the speech that we did at the rally after the leadership election results mm. on Thursday. That was, you know, most of that was written that morning. Um, and you know, with a fifty percent chance of me never having to make it, and thinking these are good lines, Norman can have these. Um, but right. in the end I got to use them.